Hey, what up? Welcome to the exciting world of medical terminology. Let's get started. Chapter 1, Introduction to Medical Term. Here you can see we have a breakdown of what we expect to learn in Chapter 1. We have word parts are the key, word roots, suffixes, prefixes, determining meanings of the basis of word parts, medical dictionary use, pronunciation, spelling, using abbreviations, singular and plural endings, uh, basic medical terms and look-alike and sound-alike. Let's get started. This is a good spot to check for every chapter. This shows you your key word parts and key medical terms. These key medical terms you can guarantee will be on your test, and the key word parts are a good way to quiz yourself and make sure that you're learning the material in appropriate time. When learning a new medical term, it's important to break it apart and learn the different parts of the term. For example, every medical term should have at least two parts, but some may include up to three. The beginning of a medical term, the very beginning, is called a prefix. The middle of a medical term is known as the word root, and the end is known as the suffix. You will generally find the same information in the same locations of medical terms. In the prefix, the prefix usually will contain information such as the location, on your body or time, how long something's been going on, number of things like one, two, or three, or the status of something like good or bad. The word root will contain either the basic meaning of what we're discussing or a specific body part or location. Finally, the suffix will contain either the procedure, the condition, the type of disorder, or the disease identif identifier so that you understand what exactly you're talking about about that body part. So this is table 1.1 in your book. We want to look, these are three rules for word part guidelines. First thing, a word root cannot stand alone. So you're never just going to have a word root by itself. You're always going to add a suffix to a word root to make an actual medical term. Second, the rules for the use of combining vowels apply when a suffix is added to a word root. So we're going to talk about that in a minute, but sometimes you'll use a combining vowel and sometimes you won't. Third, when a prefix is necessary, it's always put at the beginning. So a prefix you will always find at the beginning. And those are your rules for word part guidelines. So one of the first things we need to talk about when discussing medical terminology are word roots. You probably already know a lot of word roots without realizing it. For example, if you go to the gym and you're getting some cardio, what part of your body are you working out? You're, you're working out your heart. And so cardi, cardio actually means heart. Um, some most of the time a word root is actually describing a part of the body but it also could mean like a color um, th there's a few different things that a word root can actually be and beyond that a word root usually will have a combining vowel combining vowel you'll see as a slash and then a vowel after if the suffix is going to begin with a consonant then you want to use the combining vowel if the suffix begins with a vowel then you don't use the combining vowel and it's that simple Tables 1.2 and 1.3 also deal with uh, word roots and the rules for using combining vowels. In table 1.2, you'll see word roots indicating color, like cyan, cyano, meaning blue, erith, erythro, meaning red, luke, luco, meaning white, milan, milano, meaning black, and poli, polio, meaning gray. Now, there's four different specific rules for using combining vowels. The very first is straightforward and simple. So a combining vowel is used when a suffix begins with a consonant. They give you the example of plasti, which is a suffix meaning surgical repair. So we're going to actually use the combining vowel in the example of nerve, which is neur, neuro as a word root. And so because plasti begins with a consonant, you're going to use that O. So neuroplasty would be your actual medical term. And that's a term that includes a word root and a suffix. Next, part two is a combining vowel is not used when the suffix begins with a vowel. So here they give you a suffix itis, which means inflammation. And so for the exact same word root, neuro, nerve, and eur slash o, because itis begins with a vowel, on this one you would not use the combining vowel. So instead of neuroitis, we're going to drop the combining vowel for this example because the suffix begins with a vowel. So your actual medical term would be neuritis, which means inflammation of a nerve. Rule number three, a combining vowel is always used when two or more word roots are joined. 
So now this actually replaces a previous rule. Now, even if the next suffix begins with a vowel, if you're using two combining vowels, you're always gonna use it when you have two word roots. So let's say that you're combining the word roots gastro and enter, enter o. So you got gastra, gastro, meaning stomach, and you got enter, entero, meaning small intestine. If you're adding both of those together, then you're going to use the combining vowel because you're combining together two different word roots. However, on the second word root, you would not use the combining vowel because once you use the suffix, the suffix begins with a vowel. So for gastro enter itis, the O combining vowel is used on gastra, gastro for stomach, but it's not used in the inter, intero on small intestine because the following is a suffix which begins with a vowel. So you're not going to use the combining vowel on that. Your actual medical term would then be gastroenteritis. Two word roots, gastro and enter, and then itis meaning inflammation. So gastroenteritis means inflammation of the stomach and small intestine. The very last rule, Number four is a prefix does not require a combining vowel. So anytime you use a prefix, you just slap it right on the beginning of the word, and that will complete the term. A suffix is added to a word root after a combining vowel, or if you don't have a combining vowel, then just after the actual word root, to complete the term. Um, a suffix can also give you other information like, is this a type of procedure? Is this a condition that the person is suffering from? Is this a type of disorder or disease? Um, it doesn't always mean something like that, but it usually will. We have a few examples of suffixes here. For example, if we just want to say pertaining to, like we're talking about the heart, you have the word root cardi, cardio, meaning heart. We can just add the word ac, ac, meaning pertaining to. We can also add um to create a noun. So if we're speaking about the actual skull itself, we could say um, crany, um, as in crany, cranio, meaning skull. Um, suffixes could also mean something like an abnormal condition. So something like osis, the suffix osis, O-S-I-S, -S, will mean an abnormal condition. So if we say gastrosis, the word root gastra, gastro, would mean stomach, and osis would mean abnormal condition. So the term gastrosis simply means abnormal condition of the stomach. Now let's examine the suffixes related to pathology. There are a lot here and some are a little similar, so please pay particular attention to those, such as algia and dynia. Algia means pain and suffering. Dynia also means pain. So those are both suffixes that pertain to pain or suffering or discomfort. Inflammation is itis. We have malacia for abnormal softening, megaly for enlargement, necrosis, meaning tissue death, sclerosis, meaning abnormal hardening, and stenosis, meaning abnormal narrowing. Now let's check out suffixes related to procedures. First is centesis. That's a surgical procedure to remove fluid for diagnostic purposes, or just to remove excess fluid. Next we have ectomy which is surgical removal. Graphy, which is the process of recording a picture. Gram, which is the actual record or the picture. Plasty, which is surgical repair. And scopy, or scopy, which means visual examination. Finally, in suffixes, we have double RRs, or double Rs. They can be particularly confusing. First, we have rage, or ragia, which means bursting forth, like abnormal excessive fluid discharge or really bad bleeding. Next, we have raffi, like suturing or stitching, sewing someone up. We also have rhea, like diarrhea, which means abnormal flow or discharge. Uh, we also finally have rexus, meaning rupture. This is a good opportunity to start looking at some medical terms with different suffixes and comparing and contrasting them. We'll start now. All right, first we've got tonsillitis. Tonsil, tonsillo, meaning the tonsils, which are part of your adenoids. And then we got itis, which is inflammation. Cardiac, cardi, cardio, meaning heart, and ac, 
just finishing it out, making it a medical term. Ectomy, meaning surgical removal, is added to the word root tonsil, tonsillo. So that is surgical removal of the tonsils, tonsillectomy. Now we have three gastra, gastros, meaning stomach. So let's check out the different suffixes to see what each one of these terms means. First one, gastrosis. Osis means abnormal condition. So this just means any type of abnormal condition in the stomach. So anytime the stomach is not normal, it's known as gastrosis. Next we have gastralgia. Gastralgia means pain. So this is a stomach ache. Finally, we have gastrodynia. Gastrodynia also means pain in the stomach. You can use either one you would like, gastralgia or gastrodynia. Next, we've got gastra, gastro again, with itis as the suffix this time. Itis, of course, is inflammation. So we have inflammation of the stomach, gastritis. Arteriomalacia. Malacia is a suffix that means abnormal softening. And arteri, arterio, is a word root that means artery. So arteriomalacia would be a term that means abnormal softening of the artery. Hepatomegaly. Megaly is a suffix that means abnormal enlargement. And hepat, hepato, is a word root that means liver. So the medical term hepatomegaly is a term that means abnormal enlargement of the liver. Next, we have three terms that pertain to the artery. An artery is a blood vessel that takes blood away from the heart. First term is arteriostenosis. Stenosis, the suffix that means abnormal narrowing, means that there's less blood flow allowed through this artery because it's becoming more narrow, possibly because it's becoming clogged with like cholesterol or fatty plaque. Next, we have arteriosclerosis. The suffix sclerosis pertains to abnormal hardening. So therefore, arteriosclerosis means the abnormal hardening of an artery. Finally, we have arterionecrosis. The suffix necrosis pertains to tissue death. So the death of an artery would be arterionecrosis. Now we have abdominocentesis, appendectomy, and arteriography. First, abdominocentesis. Abdominocentesis from abdomen, abdomino, meaning the abdomen, so around your stomach area, and centesis, meaning surgical puncture to remove fluid. So abdominocentesis would be surgical puncture of the abdominal cavity to remove fluid. Next, we have appendectomy. Appendectomy from append, appendo, meaning appendix, and ectomy, meaning surgical removal. So appendectomy would mean surgical removal of the appendix. Finally, we have arteriography. Graphy, meaning the process to record a picture or just recording something. And artery, arterio, meaning artery. So we have arteriography, meaning the process of recording a picture of an artery. We also have arteriogram, endoscopy, myoplasty. So arteriogram would be the actual recording, the piece of paper or the actual video that was produced from the arteriography. Next, endoscopy. So the endoscopy is going to be the actual process of scanning and visually examining inside the body. Finally, myoplasty. Plasty is a suffix that means surgical repair. So my, myo, meaning muscle, would be surgical repair of the muscle, myoplasty. Finally, we have the double R's, hemorrhage, myorrhaphy, diarrhea, myorexis. Rage and rhagia both mean bursting forth, as in excessive fluid discharge from bleeding. So hemorrhage means the loss of a large amount of blood in a short amount of time. Heme, hemo, means blood, and rage means bursting forth. So rage and rhagia both refer to the flow of blood. If you're going to try to remember this, think about the suffix and then think about how rage may lead to a bloody fight. Raffi means suture or stitch. Myorafi means to suture a muscle wound. So my, myo meaning muscle and raffi meaning to suture. To remember this one, think of wrap as if you were going to wrap the injury up in sutures. Rhea 
means abnormal flow or discharge and refers to the abnormal flow of most body fluids. Diarrhea is abnormally frequent loose or watery stools. Dia meaning through and rhea meaning abnormal flow. Although rhea and rage both describe a normal flow, they're both not used the same way because rhea is basically any type of body fluid and rage just specifically means blood. Last, we have rexus, which means rupture. So let's use the example myorexus. Myorexus means the rupture of a muscle. My, myo meaning muscle, and rexus meaning to rupture. To remember the suffix, think of the X as being ready to rupture and fly apart. Now let's discuss prefixes. A prefix is added to the beginning of a word to change the meaning of that term. So sometimes it'll change the like location or time, maybe the number. For example, the term natal, natal means pertaining to birth. Nat means birth and al means pertaining to. So let's look at a couple examples. Here we have prenatal, perinatal, and postnatal. Prenatal means the time and events before birth. Pre means before, nat means birth, and al means pertaining to. Perinatal refers to the time and events surrounding birth. Peri meaning surrounding, nat meaning birth, and al meaning pertaining to. So this is the time just before, during, and just after birth, like during labor and delivery, just up leading to before and right directly after. Postnatal means time and events after birth. Post means after, nat means birth, and al means pertaining to. Now let's look at contrasting and confusing prefixes. Some prefixes are confusing because they're similar in spelling but opposite in meaning. So we have some really common ones that are right here in table 1.4. First we have ab, which means away from. So if we put ab in front of normal, we get abnormal, which means not normal or away from normal. Now on the opposite of that we have ad, which means toward or in the direction of. So let's use the example of addiction, which means drawn towards or a strong dependence on a drug or a substance. We also have dis. Dis means bad, difficult, or painful. So if we were to put that prefix in front of the word functional, we would get the term dysfunctional, meaning an organ or a body part that's not working properly. The opposite of dis would be u, spelled e-u, and that means good, normal, well, or easy. So euthyroid means a normally functioning thyroid gland. Hyper means excessive or increased. So the term hypertension is higher than normal blood pressure. The opposite is hypo, meaning deficient or decreased. Hypotension is lower than normal blood pressure. Inter means between or among. So interstitial means between but not within the parts of a tissue. The opposite of that is intra, meaning within or inside. Intramuscular means inside of or within a muscle. Sub means under, less, or below. Subcostal means below a rib or ribs. Supra is the opposite of sub. Supra means above or excessive. So the term supracostal would mean above or outside the ribs. Knowing the meaning of word parts often makes it possible to figure out the definition of an unfamiliar medical term. To determine a word's meaning by looking at the component pieces, you must first separate it into word parts. Always start at the end of the word with the suffix, and then work your way towards the beginning. As you separate the word parts, identify the meaning of each. Identifying the meaning of each part should give you the definition of the term. Because some word parts have more than one meaning, it's also necessary to determine the context in which the term is being used. So context means determine which body system the term is referring to. If you have any doubt, use your medical dictionary to double check your definition. You can Google it as well. So let's look at an example. Otorhinolaryngology. Um, it's made up of three different combining forms. It has a suffix, 
Uh, let's look at all the different parts starting at the end and working our way to the beginning. Ology means the study of. The word root, laryng, laryngeo, means the larynx in the throat. And we don't use the combining vowel in that one because ology already has a vowel. So we don't need to use the combining vowel. Before that, we have rhine, rhino, meaning nose. And we did use the combining vowel on that one because it's joining another word root. So it's in between otorhino, laryngology. So we need to use the combining vowel. Before that, we have ot which is a combining form, ot, auto, meaning ear. And we do use the combining vowel there because it's joining another word, root. Altogether, it's otorhinolaryngology, which is the study of the ears, nose, and throat. Because this is such a long name, we usually abbreviate it as ENT, as in an ear, nose, and throat. Learning to use a medical or dental dictionary is an important part of mastering the correct use of medical terms. I can give you a couple tips for using a medical dictionary and also googling terms. Sometimes you have to just guess. When you're able to guess at the meaning of a term on the basis of the word parts that make it up, you must always double check it for accuracy because sometimes the term can have more than one meaning. For example, there's a term lithotomy. If we just look at lithotomy, it means a surgical incision for the removal of a stone. Lith, litho, means stone. Otomy means surgical incision. We're going to talk about lithotomy, removal of a stone by surgical incision, more in chapter 9. But when we get to chapter 15, you'll also find out that lithotomy is also the name of an examination position in which a patient is lying on their back with their feet and legs raised up and supported in stirrups. So it can be a little bit confusing. If you know how to spell the word, then try googling it or maybe looking it up inside your medical or dental dictionary. On the basis of the first letter of the word, start in the appropriate section of the dictionary. Look at the top of the page for clues. Top left word is the first term on the page and the top right is the last term on the page. Next, you're going alphabetically, so start with A, end with Z, and then the first and second letters of the word, and keep going as you go through the word. When you think you've found it, check the spelling very carefully, letter by letter, working from left to right. Sometimes there's terms that are spelled really similar. And then when you find and actually check the word, then make sure that you know all the different definitions so there's no confusion. If you don't know how to spell the word, then try to carefully listen to it and then sound it out and then spell it down on a piece of paper as best as you can. If it's a type of disease or syndrome, then try looking it up under its category. Like maybe look up a list of those types of diseases or maybe look up a list of those types of syndromes. Maybe you can pick it out of the list and then narrow it down from there. On table 1.5, we have guidelines to looking up unfamiliar terms. For example, if it sounds like F or F, it may begin with the letter F, like flatus, which is gas from the stomach or intestine, like a burp or a fart. There's also F, like PH, which is phlegm. And that's excessive mucus or a discharge of some mucus out of your mouth or nose. If it sounds like J or J, then it might start with the letter G, like gingivitis, which is inflammation of your gums. Or it could start with the letter J, like in the word jaundice. Jaundice is the yellowing of your skin or your eyes. If it sounds like K, or maybe it begins with the letter K, then there's a couple different letters it could be. It could start with the letter C, like the term crepitus. Crepitus is the grating sound or the, the sensation that you would feel if you broke a bone and the bone was grinding against each other. Um, CH could also make the K sound, like cholera. Cholera is a bacterial infection of your small intestine. You can get it from drinking bad water. There's also K, which starts with the letter K, like kyphosis. Kyphosis is a spinal cur curvature and it's most commonly referred to as humpback. K could also be spelled with the letters Q-U, like the term quadriplegia. Quadriplegia refers to the paralysis of all four of your limbs. Now, if it sounds like the letter S or S, 
Then it could be cytology. Cytology is spelled with the letter C. Cytology is the study of plant and animal cells. S could also start with the letters PS, like the term psychologist. A psychologist is a person that studies the treatment of behavior. S could also start with the letter S, like serology. And serology is the study of blood serum for pathogens or different substances. Another tricky one is Z, like the maybe it starts with the letter X in xeroderma. Xeroderma is dryness of the skin. We also have Z in zygote, and zygote is a fertilized ovum. Medical terms can be easier to understand and remember when you know how to pronounce them properly. To help you pronounce terms, your books identified each new term in the text in bold. The term is followed in parentheses by a commonly accepted pronunciation and then the definition. In this sounds like pronunciation system, the word is respelled using normal English letters to create sounds that are familiar. To produce a new word, just say it as it's spelled in the parentheses. However, a word of caution. Frequently, there's more than one correct way to pronounce a medical term. Tomato, tomato, potato, potato. The pronunciation, pronunciation of many medical terms is based on their Greek, Latin, or other foreign origin. However, there is a trend toward pronouncing terms as they would sound in English. The result is having more than one correct pronunciation for a term. In your textbook, sometimes an alternative pronunciation is included to reflect those changes. But don't worry, there, anything is correct, and so the difference is a matter of preference, whichever one you like the most. Accuracy in spelling medical terms is extremely important. Changing just one or two letters can completely change the meaning of a word, and this difference literally could be the matter of life or death for your patient. The section look alike and sound alike terms and word parts later in this chapter is going to help you become aware of some of the terms and word parts that are frequently confused. Also, notice how I've corrected my terms here on this slide. I've spelled exactly incorrectly three times in a row, but instead of scribbling them out so I couldn't see what was underneath them, I've simply drawn a line through and then put my initials next to it, showing that I made that mistake and also making sure that I didn't cover up what was mistaken so it doesn't show that I'm trying to alter any records or change the information that was supposed to be there. This is how I'd like you to make your corrections for my class in the future. Abbreviations are frequently used as a shorthand way to record long and complex medical terms, but abbreviations can also lead to confusion and errors. Therefore, it's important that you be very careful when using or translating an abbreviation. For an example, the abbreviation BE means both below elbow and barium enema. A barium enema is an injection and insertion of radioactive liquid into your colon. So just imagine what a difference a mix-up here could be for your patient. Because the same abbreviation may have more than one meaning, it's important that you be very careful when using and translating any abbreviation. To be safe, you can always follow the rule, when in doubt, spell it out. Many medical terms have Greek or Latin origins. As a result of these different origins, there are unusual rules for changing a singular word into a plural form. In addition, English endings have also been adopted for some commonly used terms. So let's check out table 1.6 on page 12 to better understand how those plurals are formed. So on table 1.6 on page 12, we're looking at the guidelines to unusual plural forms. If the term ends in an A, then the plural is usually formed by adding an E. So the singular bursa becomes bursae in plural. And if we're talking about one vertebra, then we'll have many vertebrae. If a term ends in an EX or an IX, the plural is usually formed by changing EX or IX to ICES. So appendix becomes appendices and index becomes indices. If the term ends in is or is, then the plural is usually formed by changing the is to an s. So a diagnosis becomes diagnoses, and a metastasis become metastases. If the term ends in itis, 
then the plural is usually formed by changing tis to tides. So arthritis becomes arthritis, and meningitis becomes meningitis. If the term ends in nix, the plural is usually formed by changing the x to a g's. So phalanx becomes phalanges, and menix becomes meninges. If the term ends in on, then the plural is usually formed by changing the on to an a, as in criterion becomes criteria, and ganglion becomes ganglia. If the term ends in um, the plural is usually formed by changing the um to a. Uh. So in the case of diverticulum, you'll have many diverticula, and when we only have one ovum, we'll have many ova. If the term ends in us, the plural is usually formed by changing us to I. So if we look at a single alveolus, we'll have many alveoli. And if we only have one malleolus, then we'll have many malleoli. Now let's check out some basic medical terms used to describe diseases and disease conditions that are shown on Table 1.7 on page 13. Flashcards might help you out with these basic medical terms because I'm going to want you to know the difference between a sign, a symptom, and a syndrome. I'm also going to want you to know the difference between taking objective assessments and subjective assessments. A diagnosis and differential diagnosis and prognosis are also going to be important. I'm going to want you guys to keep in mind that an acute disease is something that comes on very, very sudden, and it's usually not going to be there for a very long time. You can say it was about this long, it happened because I was doing this, or something like that. Something that's chronic is something that's much, much longer, it's much more vague, Usually there's no cure for this. It's something that's been going on for a very long time. Remission is something that you've had for a while, but it's completely gone away or partially gone away. And you didn't really think you got cured from anything, but you're not suffering from the disease right now. So things seem to be pretty good. I also want you guys to check out the differences between chronic fatigue syndrome, an eponym, and an acronym. If you guys were going to have an eponym after you, would you want one or not? And finally, let's check out our look-alike and sound-alike word parts. One confusing part of learning medical terminology is dealing with words and word parts that look and sound much alike. This whole section we're going to talk about right now is some frequently used terms and word parts that you might find confusing. So pay particular attention to these terms and word parts as you're going to encounter them in the text. Arteri, arterio, means artery. Indartal means pertaining to the interior or lining of an artery. Ather, athro means plaque or fatty substance. An athroma is a fatty deposit within the wall of an artery. Arthra, arthro means joint. Arthralgia means pain in a joint or joints. The ilium is part of the small intestine. Remember that the ilium spelled with an E is spelled like intestine, I-N-T-E-S-T-I-N-E. Now the ilium is part of the hip bone. So remember that when it's spelled ilium, I-L-I-U-M, think of the I in hip, H-I-P. It doesn't have any E's in it. An infection is the invasion of the body by a pathogenic organism. The infection may remain localized or it may be systematic, which means it affects your entire body. Inflammation is a localized response to an injury or destruction of your tissues. Could also be allergic reaction and many other things. The cardinal signs indications of inflammation are redness, also known as arrhythmia, heat, swelling, also known as edema, and pain. These are caused by extra blood flowing into the area as part of the healing process. 
The suffix itis means inflammation. However, it is also often associated to indicate infection. What's the difference between laceration and lesion, you might ask? Well, a laceration is a torn and ragged wound, and a lesion is a pathologic change of the tissues due to disease or injury. You also got mucus and mucus. So, mucus is an adjective that describes the specialized mucous membranes that line the body cavities. It's spelled M-U-C-O-U-S. It's the membrane that makes mucus, which is the exact same way. Uh, you say it the exact same way. And mucus is like booger, snot. It's the phlegm. It's the noun to, it's the name of the fluid secreted by the mucous membranes. We also got myco, myelo, and myo. Myke, myco means fungus. So mycosis means any disease caused by fungus. Myke means fungus and osis means abnormal condition. Myel, myelo means bone marrow or spinal cord. So myelopathy is any pathologic change or disease in the spinal cord. Now, the spinal cord itself is not actually made out of the same stuff that bone marrow is made out of. Bone marrow is made out of two different types of marrow, and it's what you find on the inside of your long bones in the little hollow section. But in the spinal cord, it, it's not the same stuff. That's actually packed nervous tissue, part of your central nervous system. But, you know, a long time ago when you were to dissect those two different things, they probably look fairly similar, and so that's where the same term comes into play. We also have my, myo, which means muscle. Myopathy is any pathologic change or disease in your muscle tissue. We also have the difference between ologist and ology. Ologist is the specialist, so a gerontologist is a specialist in diagnosing and treating diseases, disorders, problems associated with aging, because geront means old age and ologist means specialist. Ology is the study of, so neonatology, would be the study of disorders of the newborn. Ostomy and otomy. Ostomy means to surgically create an artificial opening. So a colostomy is a surgical creation of an opening between the colon and the body's surface because col, colo means colon, and ostomy means artificial opening. Otomy means cutting into or surgical incision. So a colotomy is a surgical incision into the colon. Col, colo meaning colon, and otomy meaning surgical incision. Now we also have palpation and palpitation. Palpation is to touch, to feel. It's an examination technique in which your hands are used to feel the texture, size, consistency, and location of certain body parts. We're going to check this out more in chapter 15. Palpitation is when your heart is pounding or racing and you can feel it like beating out of your chest. We're going to look at that a little bit more in chapter 5. And we also have prostate and prostrate. The prostate is the male gland that lies underneath the urinary bladder and surrounds the urethra. Whereas prostrate means collapse and be lying flat or to be overcome with exhaustion. Pyolo, pyo, and pyro. We have pyolo, which means renal pelvis, which is part of your kidney. Pyelitis would be the inflammation of your renal pelvis. Pi, pyo, means pus. So pyoderma is any pus-producing disease of your skin. Anytime pus is coming out, white, you know, stinky, gunky mixture. Pi, pyo means pus, and derma is a suffix that means skin. Pyro means heat, fever, or fire. So pyrosis, also known as heartburn, is a discomfort due to the regurgitation of stomach acid upward into your esophagus. Pyre, pyro, meaning fever or fire, and osis, meaning abnormal condition. Supination and suppuration. So supination is the act of rotating your arm so that the palm of your hand is forward or upward. So what I want you to do is hold out your hands and so your palms are facing down, so you're looking at the back of your hands. Now rotate your hands so that the palms of your hands face towards the sky. You just perform supination. Now suppuration is the formation or discharge of pus. So anytime you have the formation of discharge of pus, that's known as suppuration. 
Suturing and ligation. Suturing is the act of closing a wound or an incision by stitching or sewing up or other similar means. Ligation is actually tying or binding off. So if you want to like, you know, constrict a blood vessel and actually tie it off so it doesn't, you know, produce anymore, or any kind of ducting, anything that's hollow with a tube, then that would be known as ligation. Triage and trauma. Triage is the medical screening of patients to determine the relative priority of need and the proper place of treatment. For example, going into the emergency room, you're going to talk to a nurse when you first go in and they're going to find out, you know, what kind of injuries do you have? Can you come right in right now because you have a heart attack? Or are you going to wait in the waiting room for the next four hours? Trauma means wound or injury. So any types of injuries or wounds that might occur because of accidents or shootings, natural disasters, fires, all those would be traumatic. Finally, we have viral and virile. Viral means pertaining to a virus or any kind of poison, something that's going to be detrimental to your health or possibly kill you. Then the suffix al means pertaining to. Virile means to be possessing masculine traits. So that's going to conclude our look-alike and sound-alike terms. So that's everything. I just want to remind you, don't cram. You know, try to do a little bit of this every single day. About 30 minutes a day, we'll do it. Um, best way to study, probably write down the term on one side of a piece of paper, write the definition on the other side, cover up half the paper, um, go down and, you know, see if you know the definition for the term or if you know the term that goes to the definition. As you learn them, then put a star by it or a check mark by it so you don't need to keep going over the same terms over and over again and just try to keep studying the terms that you don't know. Uh, make sure you like and subscribe. Also, I wanted to point out this quote by William Osler, who's the co-founder of John Hopkins Hospital. The good physician treats the disease. The great physician treats the patient who has the disease. Could actually earn you some extra credit points Monday morning. So be ready with some of that information when you come to the door. Also, make sure that you really check through the video because extra points could have been found anywhere in there. If you'd like to join in the discussion or you have any questions, comments, or concerns, make sure you comment down below. Hope to see you soon. Be good people, do good things, and I'll see you all later. Bye.